When a member of the President's Cabinet of the United States of America walks in the room, you give them the flowers that they deserve. We give them absolutely. But when it's a black person and a sister, <laughs> you are so insane. <laughs> Pretty much. You can't do this same. You cannot. You cannot build something like this from ground up. A nonprofit social investment. Madam Secretary, when I did this, I mean, people rolled their eyes at me. They, they, oh, John Bryant, oh, financial literacy, oh, capitalism. I mean, for a, I mean, for a decade, people just rolled their eyes. Um, nobody's rolling their eyes anymore. And, but you have to be a little, a little off to do this. You have to be, to, to, to believe you can change the world or get people to believe in themselves at scale. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You, you do it well, every day. This is your job. It is. That is what I do every single day. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that when people ask me, do I still have hope for this country? I have to have hope. Yeah. It is something that gets me up every single day. Yes. You know, I'm, a, I'm a, a kid that grew up poor and didn't even really know I was poor. Uh, you know that kind of kid, but I grew up in a home. Mm. And I'm one of the kids that got out of a neighborhood that a lot of people don't get out of. Mm. And so as a consequence, I carry their hopes and dreams. That's right. So failure is not an option. That's it. It just isn't an option. It is important for people, especially children, to have a sense of security. I grew up in this big house with a whole lot of people in it, right? In what city? In Cleveland, Ohio. There we go. So I, I, uh, on, uh, we had this two-family house. On one side of the house was my great-grandparents, my aunt and uncle, and their six kids, and whoever moved from the south. On our side was my grandparents, my mother, my brother, and I, my aunt and her kids, and whoever moved from the south. And so we had a house full of people all the time. I never knew what it was like to not feel supported and loved. Mm. Never knew it. Mm. And so that's why I've always believed that I could do whatever I wanted to do. That's right. But young people that don't have that security. That's right. Parents who don't know where their children will sleep at night. Parents who can't say to their kids, you know what? Little Johnny or little Mary, I need you to just go to school and not worry about anything else. Mm. But when children take on those burdens that they see in their parents' struggle, it makes their lives so difficult. So I want every child to grow up like I did. It didn't make any difference that I was poor. Yeah. I had everything I needed. Yeah. And I need every child in this country to do that. And that is my mission. That is my mission. You remind me of my mother. <laughs> um, you look like her. Oh my gosh. Uh, she had the same spunk as you. She would tell me off just like you just did. <laughs> um, and all in love and encouragement, she'd hold me accountable as you held people accountable. Um, she was a big dreamer. And she, she passed on two months ago. She was on the stage last year. I'm sorry. But I, I sort of feel her channeling energy through you. Thank you. And as you were talking, it reminded me of a quote that was in partly inspired by her because she told me she loved me every day of my life. She said, there's a difference between being broke and being poor. Mm -hmm. Being broke is economic, but being poor is a disabling frame of mind and a depressed condition of our spirit. And we must vow never, ever, ever to be poor again. You, know. you were broke, but you weren't poor. That is exactly right. You, you, you were told you, lo you were loved, you believed. Every day. Every day, and now you're pouring that institutionally, structurally into... You, you try to figure out, my sense is, you correct me, you try to figure out where is the, where is the place where I can take my gifts and my, intel, my intelligence and my self-love and have the biggest impact in a short period of time on my people and on all people who struggle and who don't believe at scale. Did I get that right? You got it absolutely right. The one thing that I realized 
over my career is that we are not a problem people. Mm. We are people with problems. Woo! And I think That's it is it. important for the government to show that they work for us because that is the government's job. That's right. And so if we can't convince people that we can make your life better, I have no business here, John. Mm, yes. You know, I, I, I really believe very strongly that I am just one of God's chosen people. I believe that. I live every day like that. Uh, and so I am put in places to make change. Yes. Uh, and if I have to tear it up, then I will tear it up. Yes. Uh, because sometimes that's what you have to do. I mean, institutional racism is real. Mm. Redlining is real. Mm. Uh, discrimination and bias in housing is real. Mm. So if you don't come and call it out and fight it mm. and bring the people around you who can make it happen, then I have no business here. Mm. I might as well just go home because I'm old enough to retire. I can go sit home. That's right. But right now, because I don't want another job, I don't need another job, mm. I'm going to leave this with the legacy that I think that I want to leave it with. Yeah. Well, there are not many, uh, there are not many job, not how many callings more relevant or important in the world than Secretary the United States Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the President's Cabinet, as I keep repeating, uh, 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 the largest and most successful economy and country in the world. You know, my, some of my friends will complain about America. And I say, look, democracy and capitalism are horrible systems, except for every other system. That's right. And I say, UK, you don't like this. You don't like that. I get it. I'm with you. Here's a plane ticket. Not, but not only they that. never leave. Because they have no place to they go. No place to go. No place Wherever to go. you go, it's worse than this. Absolutely. The other thing is that we get so caught up in who we like. That's right. How somebody says something. But let's, let's finally take the time to support people who support our communities, who support our children, That's right. who support our jobs. But no, we gotta, we gotta like somebody. They not coming to your house for dinner. I don't care if you don't like them. That's it. You know, we have to do. That's it. This is, this is, when you live this life, you don't opt out, John. That's it's, right. You don't opt out. That's right. You have to decide that you are going to live it to its fullest, give the best you've got. That's right. And support people who need your help. That's right. I speak for people who have no voice every mm. day. And I am fortunate, quite honestly, to work for a president and vice president who let me do what I want to do. That's right. You know, so people, people don't realize what we do. My budget, my just operating budget is $80 billion. My operating budget. Wow. $80 billion a year. Right. I have more than 8,000 employees. Yep. We just last year spent almost a half a billion dollars on contracts with black, brown, and small businesses. Last year. We spent more money trying to make sure that we could get people in homes. Who else comes into a job and says, you know what, if you have student debt, I'm gonna make it so that it doesn't affect you in a way that you can't get a mortgage. So we've changed the way we do underwriting for student loan debt. Because who has that? Black, brown, and poor people. That's right. We came in and we said, you know, if you pay your rent on time, it should mean something. But people come to present to lenders, and because they have no other credit, they'll say, you're not credit worthy. That's right. Now we're saying, if you've paid your rent on time for a year, we deem you credit worthy. Right. Because it's the only way you get yourself out of the situation. We have situations now where the president in his last budget asked for $100 million just for down payment assistance. Nice. Because we know if people can pay their rent, they can pay a mortgage because yeah. it's generally less. It's the down payment that creates the impediment. So we are putting down payment money on the table. Nice. People just don't realize the work we do. It's little, but it's big. So one thing, one thing that frustrates me, I mean, marketing is just so important. And sometimes idiots are the best marketers. And what I don't get, uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm nonpartisan. I, I've, I've advised Republican and Democratic presidents. I, but let me just tell you, President Biden has actually really fostered a pretty stable economy. That's right. There's a lot of jobs, there's a lot of growth. I mean, just looking at the numbers, you really have to be sort of impressed. And, and but people want to you know, 
beat him up and talk. Look, this is not personal. Look, right. look at the data. The, the data is undeniable. He's succeeding. And, and so, and, and, and I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get the games. We, we, need, we need to figure out, America needs to win. The bingo. We need to win. Again, I'm going to say it again. If we don't, we'll be speaking Mandarin in 10 years <laughs> because there are countries who want to replace us. And we keep playing this game of I want me to win and you to lose. No, no, no. I, you, I can win and you can win too. And, 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 and so, look, uh, I, 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 I think that you guys, clearly there are areas that everybody can improve on. And, 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 and I said yesterday that, you know, I said last night on CNBC that there was probably a bit too much stimulus money. Well, that was bipartisan, by the way. Everybody Thank did that. You, but, but we were also trying to keep the economy from melting down because no one had a book to pull off the shelf called What Do You Do in a Pandemic Every 200 Years? So I think we've actually done an extraordinary job. You have done an extraordinary job. The administration has done under trying circumstances. Nobody's perfect. And you're now, as the Secretary of, of Housing and Development, you just laid out some of the priorities, just some of the things you're doing, which are incredible. Uh, and and I'm, let me say this, she, she is speaking to help, she is speaking and doing to help, helping everybody in this country, even though she's mentioned black people, because she's black and I'm black. She wants to help poor whites, she wants to help Asians, she wants to help Native American Indians, she wants to help struggling middle class families, make it clear, her mission's for everybody. I don't want anybody messing this up Thank and you. putting words in her mouth. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, he's absolutely right. I go to Indian country. I go to Appalachia. I go everywhere in the country. Because anybody that needs us, I need to be there. That's right. I don't care who they are. That's right. <laughs> let me, let me, let me, Mr. Madam Secretary, let me, let me jump on a pet, a pet peeve of mine. And I'm, by the way, y'all time cleavers, I'm watching you. Every, and whenever I get to six minutes, y'all take me to zero. I'm watching you. Um, I, want, I, I need all this time with her. Um, Madam Secretary, one of my pet peeves is that black people are at 41 to 43 percent home ownership. And the number one way you build wealth in America is home ownership. Am I right about that? Absolutely right. And my mainstream counterparts, uh, are at 75 percent, give or take, home ownership rate. That 30 percent delta, the difference between that, is why we don't have a net worth. And we keep, was, was one of the primary reasons, that and what Toby just left, small business creation. Though you and him really are the anchors for the solution. Uh, uh, and what Bishop Jakes is doing, you were with him yesterday, are the anchors for the solution for the revitalization of all of us. But we, we got to stop talking and start doing because if we don't, if, if black people keep doing what we're doing, statistics say that by 2050, 2052, black people net worth will be zero. Zero. And, and a lot of that is we don't own home ownership, real estate. Real estate is the biggest business in the world. Stocks. What are you doing to try to bridge that gap of, uh, uh, of home ownership for African Americans, but all other people as well, poor whites, et cetera, et cetera? We put tens of millions of dollars into housing counseling, which of course you know because we use you as well. We're honored to be one of your housing counselors. Right. Uh, so what That's we do is we try to prepare people to get ready for housing so that when the time comes, they won't have to get ready, they'll be ready. We need for people to understand what the process is and believe that they can do it because we can help them do it. But the biggest problem that we have in this country, John, is that we just don't build enough houses. So we don't build enough houses. So now, so just basic supply and demand says it's not enough. Then we go to communities and they, we say, we need to build multifamily units. They will not in my backyard, you're not gonna build it. So then we've got zoning issues where they say that you can only build a certain kind of house and that raises the price about 30%. So we have to break through all of that first off. Yes. So I meet with the housing people, I meet with mayors, I meet with governors to say, you have a problem. I can help you fix it, but I cannot fix it by myself. And so you have resources that you have never had before. The rescue plan put money into communities that they never thought they'd get, and they're sitting on it. Yeah. And so then wow. I go and I have to threaten them and say, now don't keep sitting on this money because I'm going to find a way to claw it back and give it to somebody that's going to do something that's with good. it. But the other thing we allow is we don't build 
communities and neighborhoods. Mm. So I live in I live in a community, a fairly I say middle class, but mm. but it's a community that I love and I live in it by choice. Yes. I live in a house that is two doors from an all white wealthy community. Two doors, two doors. literally. My house is bigger than the house two doors from me. Mm. My lot is bigger than the house two doors from me. My house is nicer than the house two doors from me. But that house is valued at $25,000 more than my house. Mm. Which means that my communities now don't get the benefit of those extra tax dollars. My community doesn't get the benefit of more police or fire or to make sure that my children's schools are good. And so people choose if they can afford it to live two doors from me That's as right. opposed to in my house. We have to say to America, if they really want to solve things like homelessness, uh, poor education, they have to recognize and admit that the problem exists. And once we do that, which we have at HUD, we are putting so much money into assisting with multifamily housing, uh, talking about senior housing. Do you know the fastest group of people sleeping on the streets today are black women my age? Wow. Really? My age. Because we have created an environment where they can't afford to live anymore. They can't afford their apartments. They're on, on Social Security, which is not enough. And they end up, they first off start sleeping at relatives' homes, and then they find themselves sleeping in their cars. RVs and things like that, yes. I cannot tolerate it. Yes. And so what I'm doing is putting our money where it ought to go to help people. You just don't know how much money we put in the market. But you don't know because people never ask. Yes. You know, people don't come to government and say, what can you do for me? Mm. They call when they have a specific problem. They never see the big picture, Jim. Yes. They never see it. Yes. So, but when I sit down with home builders and I say to them, you have to build this many homes to just get us where we need to be. We are 1.5 million homes short of where we need to be today. Mm. Today. So there's an opportunity to do infill development. Right. That Listen to our entrepreneurs now. Listen, what she said was, she didn't say it, she inferred, if you, need, if you, have, a, if you have a gap of 1.5 million homes, you can go and find a lot. You don't need acres and acres and acres. Find right. a lot, right. buy it, build it, use minority and women vendors if you can to build it, rent it or sell it to somebody who might be underserved and get the benefits, uh, use the programs at HUD to uh, empower you with the right mortgages and the right down payment assistance, uh, and then you create a tax base in that city, you create a taxpayer in that city, you create a, a homeowner in that city, you keep create equity in that city, you create uh, asset accumulation, generational wealth, uh, and you're creating jobs and opportunity. Did I get that right? You got it absolutely right. But let me, we want everything easy. Just tell me where to go to get the money. This is what we want. Yeah, it don't work that way. It doesn't. The federal government is flush with resources to help entrepreneurs. You just have to know where to go. So it, it, it's going to be important for people to realize how to connect the dots, John. Yes. So I talk about housing, but transportation has money that can deal with where we build housing. Mm. EPA has money that can deal with where we build housing. Environmental oh, Right. Uh, uh, USDA has resources to build rural housing. Mm -hmm. People are so, we are linear thinkers because we don't realize what's available to yes. us. So everywhere I go, I tell them, now you need to call this person. I met with black developers in um, New York a couple of weeks ago to tell them about the things we could do. But in the meantime, I said, you build an infrastructure, we passed an infrastructure bill. Mm. You, you're talking about environmentals. We do have money in EPA. So I go through this whole thing because I want everybody to know what I know. Yes. Because until they do, we leave so much money on the table. Yes. And the other thing I think that is just important for what you do in talking about financial literacy, et cetera, if we don't start figuring out what things cost and what they mean to us yes. and how to get them, yes. uh, we're going to be forever people listening to people who say, oh, you don't need to buy a house. You know, and I know you've heard it. People say, you know, today's young people, they don't want to be tethered to that. You know, they like the life of living in the, con I mean, you know, the apartments and stuff. But they leave with nothing. That's right. So it's all good to think about that. But one thing that I knew as a child is a home was important. Land is important. Mm. Even when I went south, it's like we own this land. That's right. 
because they knew what today we forget. Yes. Is that if you don't own anything, yes. where does your life go from there? Yes. You can't leave anything to help your children. The reason why there's a big gap between black and brown home ownership and white home ownership is because white people take the value out of their homes and help their children. Mm, that's right. We don't have the value to give. That's right. So the more we buy and the more we are able to leave something for the generations that follow, the better we become as a country. Because when people, all people, have a place to live, it becomes a foundation upon which they can do anything. Mm. They can be anything. Mm. But every single person in this country deserves. I believe housing is a right. That's just my personal Opinion. Absolutely. John, we deserve it. And we have the resource. We need to make the government work for us. That's right. And if we don't, it's our fault because we can. Now, I'm not going to be up here talking about elections, etc. But what I do know is that if we don't make our voices heard, nothing will happen for us. That's right. So you can sit back if you want to. I'm not. No, you're definitely not. You're no wilting lily. Are you guys enjoying this? Is she real or what? And if, and if ever you get confused listening, going, oh, she just sounds so real. She sounds like she, you know, she's a lady down the street. Or is it, it, just look at the Secret Service protection or the, the, on both sides. It, remi it, it will remind you <laughs> real quick. Um, so a couple things before, and thank you so much for coming to be with us, we're so honored. Happy to be here. Uh, honored to have uh, the, the premier leader, the voice for housing for the United States of America. Uh, you could be anywhere in the world. You came to Atlanta to be with us and give us this time. We're so honored. You were here with us yesterday. You spent the night with us. I really appreciate it. You sat down with my friend Bishop Jakes, uh, and I'm sure he appreciated that. Uh, uh, this is full circle in many ways. Uh, redlining in this country uh, did not come from banks. Redlining from in this country came from the government. That's exactly right. It was the FHA, That's right. which reports to her. Right. <laughs> That's true. Full circle. Right. In the early 1900s, Secretary, you tell me if I'm wrong here. In the early 1900s in this country, the FHA, Federal Housing Authority, uh, had basically said, look, some neighborhoods are uh, more risky or more dangerous, whatever they wanted to say. But we're uncomfortable with those neighborhoods. We don't want to do insurance. We don't want to insure mortgages in those neighborhoods from banks. So we're going to put a little map. The areas that are sort of sketchy, we'll make them yellow. Areas that we like, we'll make them green. And areas that we're concerned at, we're going to make them red on a map. That's right. And where do you think? Look, capitalism, money is lazy. Money is a coward. Money doesn't go where it's risky. Money goes where it's safe. This is not personal. It's just money. Right. So where do you think the money went? It went to the green areas. Who do you think lived in the green areas? White, wealthy, comfortable, already successful people. Where did the mortgage companies and banks not want to write a mortgage because it was not insured? The red areas. That red lining triggered banks not investing in those areas. They might have loved you. They might have thought, I love black people. I don't want to lose my money. I don't want to write a mortgage that's not insured. I'm going over here. So the capital went over here, and guess what happened to the values? Values went up over in the green areas. They went down in the red areas. And that's what she was talking about, about her, her house is basically two doors down from an area that historically was viewed as green. And it takes generations to get that rebound. That's why you can go to an appraiser, and, and an appraiser gives you some crazy appraisal uh, a, a mile from someplace else that is you know, a different hue of a neighborhood. This stuff gets bed, baked into the way in which we do business. But because she's now secretary of that Department of Housing and Urban Development, everybody's got to report to her. That's exactly right. Listen, <laughs> listen. I, 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 I hate to say it this way, but there's a new sheriff in town. Oh. So,
we having church in here on a Tuesday morning. So, Secretary Fudge, we're having too much fun. At least I am. I'm having a ball. You're having a ball. I'm glad. Uh, is there anything you want to say before we wrap this up? You are so fabulous. We could go. We could do this all day and all night with you. What is it? They, the audience loves you. What, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just really want to say that it is important for those in this room or those who have a voice that other people hear is to say the things that give people hope. To be optimistic about where we are. This is still the greatest nation in the world with all its problems. Yes. But know that there are those of us who are working hard every single day to change the lives of people. It's not just me. All of us look at things through a lens of equity. You know, this country is, it is the institutions in this country have institutionalized racism and sexism. And it's going to take us some time, but I promise you, by the time I leave this job, people are going to say, she did what? Mm. When they know what I have done, because you can't tell everything while you're doing it. <laughs> and people try to stop you. <laughs> try to stop it. So I will do everything I can. I will give it everything I have. Because I need for people to know, if nothing else, that we cared and we do. So I thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, Ambassador Young would say coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. I like that. And it is a coincidence that you are in a ballroom that's 50 feet or 100 feet from where Dr. King gave his last staff meeting before he was assassinated mm. in the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, this hotel is where he stayed. This was the first hotel that allowed Dr. King to have meetings or to, to stay here in the, in the 60s. Everybody else discriminated against blacks, even in Atlanta. Uh, and uh, you are in a place that's now moving from civil rights to silver rights, from marching in the streets to cutting business deals in the suites. Mm -hmm. And you're in a place where people are celebrating uh, the optimistic view uh, of this world and what we can do. And one of the things I've heard you say, and I want the audience to take away from this, is you basically said investment banks strategize the government. Go to, to, go to HUD and get detailed about what HUD provides. Go to USDA, go to EPA, go to Department of Commerce, where MBDA, Minority Business Development Agency is, where EDA, Economic Development Agency is, where our intellectual property right agencies are, I believe. Go to, uh, go to, the, uh, to, to, the, to the U.S., which is the, the Health and Human Services, and what I'm hearing, hearing you say, and, it, and sort of strategize what each of these agencies can do. No one of them may be able to solve all of your problems, but you take a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, and come with a strategy, and then put a little bit of seed corn in, your hustle, and then some bank capital, get, tr get Truist, get Bank of America, get Wells Fargo, get, tr get, get Regions Bank, get whomever, U.S. Bank, to, to, to lean into that. It's what, it's what people do on Wall Street. That's it's called exactly a capital right. stack. Yep, that's exactly that's what, right. Is that my, do I, have, do I yes. have this right? You said it exactly right. Exactly right. So look, we got to become more sophisticated, more thoughtful about how we solve these problems. Stop being emotional, people. That's right. This is not personal. Nobody cares enough about you to hate you. That's right. That's right. That's true. You are absolutely right. They're not waking up in the morning saying they hate you. They try to figure out how to get paid themselves. If they got to run over you, uh, <laughs> flatten you, walk around you, that's exactly what they're going to do. This is not about love or hate. Today's about radical indifference. That's exactly right. Nobody cares enough about you to hate you, but you care enough about yourself to understand this is the third reconstruction. You are sitting in a moment in history, and you got the secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development who's a real woman, a real black woman who cares about you, who's listening to you, and has told you, you can win. That's right. Give her some love, Secretary of Urban Development. Thank you. You are so wonderful. Oh, thank you.